So I'm finally going to offer some feedback about the group activity that we did related to the template for the final project and, and we'll review that template uh, and, and then see what the groups did and, and of course whoever is here today and worked uh, on that activity they can ask questions or make comments okay and, and it's not the only time we'll be talking about the final project uh, I will continue to talk about that and there is an assignment related to the final project that is due Friday of next week, which is November 10th. I will review that assignment briefly with you, the instructions for that assignment. And today's film is Traffic, directed by Jacques Tati, uh, Oscar-winning director, usually included in lists such as the 50 most influential directors of the 20th century, etc. There is a famous one um, by a British institute that includes him in that top 50, even though he only directed six feature length films. Uh, and, and we'll see, I'll introduce the film, the style of the film, and we'll see some scenes. In fact, I've also added a tab for the final scene of the film that he uh, put out in 1967 before uh, traffic which is from 1971 as i said so it's a long plan we'll see how much of that we can cover i'll sit down because i'll need to switch from one file to another as usual Call me if you have questions from this corner and I'm not uh, looking at you in that particular time. Let's review the various sections of the template for the final project. If you remember, the final project is not a traditional paper. For the final project, you do some archival research followed by cataloging, which could be best understood in common terms if you think of creating a small wiki with short stories about the automobile, explaining their significance and presenting that material together with some low-level analysis to an average reader, right? Not to your professor. The cataloging of the story goes through these sections. In the first section, once you have identified a strong story, you begin with the bibliographical references, and the most important part there is also the inclusion of the link, because it's not like Romeo and Juliet, where you can just mention the story and the professor will know what you're talking about. This might be a story that I've never read and that I need to read myself and make sure that that link is working. That is to say, once you've introduced a link, use it, test it, make sure it works. It actually takes you to the beginning of that story because there are always various options for the links. The link found in the URL section of the browser is not necessarily the best choice. It depends on the database where you are. The other element of the first section change depending on the story that you have picked, meaning you may have more or less information for this kind of section depending on the story. So basic details about the author, if you can find them, right? If we know something about the author, if we can do a simple basic research and then bring in information from qualified sources and whenever you use sources make sure you include that information that is say i'm getting this from this this kind of information about the life of the author from uh, the encyclopedia britannica or from this article or from this database etc a short classification of 
the style of the story, which could be as short as this is a humorous story making fun of the obsession of people for the cars. Or it could be a tragic story, a romantic story, right? As best you can classify the story so that people understand uh, its, its narrative articulation. It's easy to find out if the story was published somewhere else, and in that case, we want to list that, especially if the story was later published in a book or in another collection of short story, and if by any chance, and this is really something that will be missing in most instances, but if by any chance someone has published an article or included a reference to that short story in another book, it's easy to find out by using the title or uh, key elements that you can use to produce a uh, meaningful search. So let's go and see what the group who was supposed to work on this did. So this was just one group uh, because it wasn't much. However, how did you do for this section? Because you practically missed everything other than the title, right? Were you following when I was reviewing the template? So in this section, besides, for this particular story, besides what you have here, which I also had, the title, the author, the link, and, and we can make sure the link works, let's see, and the link does work. You neglected to include information about the author, right? Because you can find information about this particular author. As I said, many of these authors might not have an official entry in any dictionary, no information easily available, but in this case, the author does have articles. Yes, Madison. Oh, I apologize. I no, 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 no need to apologize. We're here to understand the process. So well, I'm not. Um, I assume that that sort of authorial analysis would go into the analysis section. I didn't know that it coincided. No, no. So. That's why it is important to understand how the template works, right? The analysis will be just the analysis of the text. And the first part of this catalog entry for the story should include a little bit of who Thomas Massing is. In this case, the story simply had TM, right? It was not difficult to find out, and I added myself the name of the author, because if you use the title of the story, you would find out that the story was published in a collection of short story by this author. Um, I think the title is A Corner in a Woman and Other Stories, and it includes this one. And there are a few entries here and there to tell you who he was and therefore, in this part, for this particular story, as I said, don't waste too much time, but make a bona fide effort to find some information about the author. And in this case, in this case the section should have included a little bit about him, what he did. He was a journalist. He uh, published short stories and books, etc. This information should, this section should have included also how the short story was included in a later publication, which is a book, and as I said, a classification of the story, which could be what I mentioned before, a humorous stories about the automobile, making fun of the uh, eagerness with which people purchase an automobile expected it will change their lives. Something like that, okay? So, again, I'm not here to scold you. I'm just 
trying to make you realize how this should be done for the purpose of the final project and to answer any questions. So once again, the link you did include, geographical references, etc. But some information about the author can be found in this case. A short one or two lines classification of the story can be put together quickly. And it should be mentioned in this case, just briefly, how this story was published um, at least once, maybe twice. I don't remember now because it's been a couple of weeks since I did this, that research myself, but at least once in a collection of short stories and mentioned the bibliographical reference for that, okay? As I said, for some other authors, it would be sufficient for you to make an effort to find information about them and then to add no information is available or readily available about the author, their life, their life, etc. Okay? So, next section of your catalog is supposed to be a short synopsis, not a genetic synopsis because you want to focus on the automobile and the role of the automobile in the narrative. And I added that if appropriate, you can include brief, brief profiles of the main characters, but it depends on the story. If you think this would be useful to someone trying to understand what the story is about. The goal, ultimately, that you have for this kind of work is to enable the reader, enable an average reader, to understand how the short story you have included is significant or relevant for the representation of the technology of the automobile at the beginning of the 20th century. Okay, so keep that in mind so that someone who has not read the story before reading the story is equipped through reading your presentation with all the information to understand not only what the story is about, but what's interesting, what's important about the story. And we have a few synopses, I think we have three in fact. Uh, we can look at the first one. We're introduced to the Van Bloomers, and of course, in this case, we don't need Mr. Van Bloomer, and of course, it's Paul, right? Uh, purchases a new car, but his wife does not seem very pleased with him purchasing the car. She keeps finding issues with the vehicle, while Mr. Von Bloomer says the car is perfectly fine. It seems like Mr. Von Bloomer has car fever, ignoring any possible issues with the car and turning a blind eye. Blind eye. Uh, he thinks the car is going to improve his life, but she thinks it's the complete opposite. These differences in opinions seem to be affecting their relationship. It's a good synopsis, a bit generic, I find, right? No need to stay away from spoilers in your synopsis. Your synopsis can be complete. It can include the, com include the conclusion. In fact, in this case, it could have included the fact that the couple decides to separate themselves from the technology to sell the car at the end. Also, in reference to relevant details, a more, a slightly more detailed representation of the issues with the car could have been included. What kind of issues do they have? How are they fixed, right? You have the multiple intervention of multiple technicians to address the issues with the car. So it's good, it's a decent length, but some more details could have been included. Make sure, of course, you are precise, right? Such as the spelling of the characters, etc. Let's look for other synopses. Here we have another one, and I'm moving to the next one, but you can interrupt me at any time with questions, especially if you work 
on this. Von Blumer purchases a brand new car out of excitement. His wife objects to this new purchase and he responds by saying that he has a mechanical mind. She questions this and he insists upon it even to go purchase the car. When he doesn't come home for hours after he claimed he would, his wife worries. I like the fact that this part of the episode, part of the story has been included. When he doesn't come home for, uh, uh, okay, he eventually makes his way home with a towed automobile. His, this new purchase, while raising his social status, forces him to challenge his own ignorances, his own ignorance about around mechanics, he insists upon knowing the things about the car even when he doesn't, so that he feels justified in his superiority. He faces challenges from both his wife and neighbor, which is a societal challenge to his new status. Eventually, he has to bend the knee to a mechanic who comes along and helps him. Through this process, von Blumer faces his own shortcomings and learns to accept help, even if in some way he lowers his social status. I like the fact that there are a few more details in this story Although, especially in the second part, the synopsis has transitioned into a collection of comments or an interpretation. Whereas, since you have a template that will include an analytical section, you want the synopsis to be a neutral description of the relevant events in the story. Certainly, it is uh, good that you included references to the mindset of the character and how his mind is affected by this purchase and the experience of the car. That is fine. But other than that, comments should be transferred into the analytical section. Okay? This is longer, which is fine. A few more details could have been added. But we find enough to get an idea. The conclusion, certainly, as I said before, I think the conclusion is key to the understanding of a story. We have a story about the automobile that is really making fun of people purchasing automobiles to the point where, at the end, they decide to sell it. Okay? Let's see if we have another synopsis. No, just relevant quotes and one analysis. So, any questions about the synopsis? So, make sure the synopsis include a step-by-step -step description of the story. You don't want to go into too many details. You want to include more details about the car than generic details about the story, because not all the stories have such an intense focus on the automobile. Other stories might include background, information about the characters, other episodes in the lives of the characters, etc. And keep the style neutral. Make the synopsis as comprehensive as possible. Questions? Okay. So let's look at the next section, which is include a few relevant questions. Basically, as I said before, the idea is that someone who's read the synopsis and knows about the story will now appreciate how precise passages or short phrases illuminate the representation of the car and the themes that are included in the short story. And then, this is just a selection of quotes then the analysis will go back both to the situations, to the story, to the characters, and, if need be, to the quotes themselves. Now, how long should the relevant quote section be? It all depends on the language of the story, right? You don't want to include a long paragraph that describes generically, let's say, an accident that happens to the car. 
you just want to include quotes where the language is significant, not what happens in general, right? So declaration by a character about the car that explain their frame of mind, how they feel before purchasing a car or while driving a car, or passages that describe the experience of the characters riding on the car. But you have to ask yourself, whenever you want to include something, is the language itself significant enough? Or is this just an episode that could have been included in the synopsis with my own words, right? That is to say, are there keywords, words that you wouldn't expect important qualifiers that open up the mind of the reader to the understanding of the story better than your own paraphrases, your own summary of a passage or an episode. So depending on the story, you might just have a few short quotes or many short quotes or a few long quotes if you find longer passages that are significant. And Make sure you include everything that is necessary to understand the sentence or the passage that you want to highlight, no more and no less. Make sure you accurately transcribe the text, okay? So, if we look at the work done here, not the slightest, the beauty about these machines, something seems to be missing right? Maybe this passage was not transcribed in its entirety, but for one thing, you could certainly skip something, like you could include square parenthesis ellipsis to signify I've skipped something that is not particularly important just to then move on to the next sentence, but something seems to be amiss. I haven't checked, but I don't think it, the character is just saying the beauty about these machines. There should be uh, more than that. That's probably during the conversation with the neighborhood. Um, but I don't know if I can find it. What's the rest of the passage? Okay, I think I know where to find it. There it is. Not the slightest. That's the beauty about these machines. So that's had been omitted. So make sure that the transcription is accurate. If you get lost, you can cover so much ground that you can always get home. This is a reference, a passage that is somewhat <coughs> important, but it falls under the category I was indicating earlier. That is to say, it's the concept more than the language that is important in here. With cars, you don't get lost. So it could be included, but uh, it, it's, it depends on how many quotes you want to include. Next one, you didn't break down once or have anything happen. More than the first doesn't tell me enough. It's kind of short. If I haven't read the story, I don't really understand the sentence. And then if I ask myself, what is the significance? of this reference, of this quote. Is it just the idea or is it the idea and the language that is significant and therefore I want to offer it to the reader? I'll skip the next one and move to this one, the fourth. Von Bloomer turns to his wife, a sudden fear possessed him I like the reference to the sudden fear, but based on this, as an external reader, 
I don't understand what the fear is about, so I would like to see more included. Yes. Can we perhaps provide the context in parentheses, for example, yes. let's say, like, yes. oh, speaking to this character, speaking to this character. Or, or, or simply, if you, if you have a series of bullet points, here I could put in italics, this is the context, who is speaking to who whom the circumstances, I hope I type correctly, this, this keyboard is very mushy. And then the sentence might be clearer. Absolutely, yes. So you could also place the sentence in a context as long as your contextualization is not too long, right? You want to keep that quick anyway. Okay, so definitely something like this is worth included. At last, we can live, I have bought an automobile. This would be a perfect example of a sentence that even without knowing the exact context, give me a sense of the kind of importance assigned by the characters to the purchase of the automobile, right? Now we're alive, now we can live. Okay, etc. Let's see some of the others and I'll move on. I want to review everything line by line. Let me see, relevant quote. So you've included the passage in which the wife tells him that he cannot do anything about the house, so the mechanical turn of mind is just a way to justify um, his purchase of the car. Right? So this is significant, definitely, both in terms of the concept, but also because it includes that phrase, a mechanical turn of mind, which is rather peculiar and unique. It is part of the language associated with the technology in a unique way, this idea also that you could go back to in the analysis that driving an automobile requires a mind and a certain kind of mindset. And it's not just about manual skills, right? Mechanical skills. So by including something like that, you can have a good quote for the reader to form an idea about the short story after they've read the synopsis and also something you can mention in your analysis, you can expand on and elaborate. The next one instead, it's mostly about the actual problems of the car. The language itself is, bless you, not so significant I would, in this case, include a reference to this episode, to this passage in the story, in the synopsis, if you think it is important, and it may be important indeed, I wouldn't include this whole quote, okay? So make sure the, that the list of relevant quotes include things that are important, both for concepts, ideas, and keywords language. And something like that can be said about the next quote that I see included here. Of course, in the analysis I would go back to it and explain that this is ironic, right? That I don't really mean that. Next one, I knew there was nothing the matter with that machine. Come, my dear, get in, and I'll show you what it can do. It's not to be excluded, but it has very little that makes it relevant, right? I'll show you what it can do, especially if you want to go back in the analysis and explain that the husband is trying to convince the wife that their life will be different and that he made a good purchase for both in a way he's trying to convert 
compared to the new technology. So if you include a reference to this passage in the analysis, then the inclusion of this is justified. And this is another way to think of this section. Do you want to also provide commentary for at least some of these passages? If they're not worth a comment, then maybe they're not worth including, okay? I would definitely not include this next one just about the exhausted batteries in the analysis, but it's something that could be, in fact, should be included in the synopsis, okay? Are you with me? Uh, making a little bit of progress in the understanding of, of this process, okay? Okay, so I'll stop here for now and go back to it maybe next week to revisit the analysis, okay? I just want you to see that by November 10th, you have the last written assignment, the last of the weekly assignments. After that, you're just supposed to be working on your final project, which is very simple in a way. You have to go back to the page with the description of the project, where you also find all the sources where you should be looking for a short story and find at least one short story. Not the examples I gave you, of course, a different one, but find at least one story that you think would be worthy of inclusion in your project and simply explain. You don't have to create the template. It's not as complicated as that. Just show me that you can find at least one story if you want to include more, please do so, and explain in simple terms why you would include that story in the project, right? Without using the template. Just put down your ideas on what makes the story interesting, appropriate, relevant for the project. Make sure you include a link so that I can click on the link, review the story, and tell you this is an extraordinary short story about the automobile you should definitely include it in your project or this story could be included but maybe you could find a better one or this story has nothing to do with the automobile really even though one of the characters at some point hails an automobile cab and they go to some place with an automobile okay so that Keep in mind, the goal of this work is to prepare the first stage, which is very important, of your research to find the material you should be working on. And then once you have that, you can proceed with the template and the cataloging. Keep in mind that before the end of the semester, you have a period of about 10 days when you can schedule a meeting on Zoom and give a presentation on the story. You can choose just one story. Your project should include three, but your presentation could be limited to one or two stories. And there too, you will get some feedback from me, okay? But the presentation is another intermediate step. You have this work just to know that you can identify stories that are worthy of inclusion in the project. You have the presentation where you offer some considerations in your own words about the story, and then you have the formal project, which is due uh, after the end of the semester, after the end of classes, I mean. Okay? Any questions for now? Okay, good. And we have a little bit of time, so let me introduce some of the topics. Let me move. Around as well. So the film is Traffic 1971 by French director Jacques Tati. Jacques Tati um, was born in France near Paris in 1907 and died in 1982. In fact, the anniversary of his death is, is coming. He died on November 5th, 1982. Uh, he um, 
left uh, school to work in the family business, but he was also very much into sports. And uh, later on, when he moved into theater, when he developed a passion for theater, which apparently was born from uh, his attempts to entertain the people he played sports with, uh, when he got into theater, he became famous for impressions of people playing sports. He was a mime. And you can see that because the film we will watch today and next week has very few lines. And it's mostly based on seeing the character interact with the characters, not just the protagonist, not just Jack Tati, the director plays the part of the main character. Also with other people and the environment, and, and yes, it's not a silent film. You can hear the background, you can hear dialogues, but sometimes you hear a dialogue, but you cannot recognize all the words, right? It's like you are there in that place, in a realistic, from a realistic point of view where you wouldn't be able to understand people talking at a distance from you. So Tati got into theater into the 1920s and 30s, and at the end of the war, he started shooting films. He served in the war uh, with, with the French army and was sent home after the French army was defeated by the Germans in 1940. During the 1940s and 50s, he did a few films, some shorts, some uh, uh, feature length. In 1958, he did this wonderful film, Mon Uncle, My Uncle, that won the Oscar as Best International Film. And he became famous all over the world after that. So for the next 10 years, between 1958 and 1967, he only worked on his next film. And since he was an Oscar winning director, he got money for a big budget film, but the project he got into was, was really ambitious. Instead of filming the uh, the film in a real location, in an outside location, or uh, doing a smaller version of the set in a studio, he practically built an entire block made of glass, with buildings made of glass and metal, because that film, Playtime, that came out in 1967, was about modernity and, and how hyper modern, super modern architecture makes people less human. The film was not as successful as it should have been to cover for uh, the amount of money that was invested. And after 1967, Tati was, was penniless, was full of debts. He was going to the president of the French Republic asking for forgiveness of his debts to the French IRS, for example. So in 1971, when he shot this film that we'll be watching today, his means, his budget was very limited. And you can see uh, uh, right away uh, what I mean. But in spite of that, he still had trouble, in spite of the fact that he reduced the budget for this particular film by a lot, and the film was supposed to be a film for TV and then was released in theaters, and this time was successful compared to the budget that was committed to it. This film could only be finished uh, because he had a crew, as, as you have sometimes on the set, sometimes on the set you have people shooting a documentary about the film you're making. And in this case, he had to rely on the equipment of this small crew that was shooting a documentary because during this period, normally he would, he would rent the equipment to shoot the film. He ran out of money, and so he was without cameras, without film, etc. So this almost wasn't finished. As I said, instead of being released just for TV, went into the theaters and enjoyed a moderate success. He went on to do a couple of films, but without the success he had enjoyed in the 1950s. He did theater, 
he did TV, he appeared as a guest on uh, uh, TVs, TV channels in, in multiple uh, countries. And I'll just tell you a few things about the scenes that we are going to see today. At the very beginning of the film, you see an automobile factory. But what you will find, what you should be paying attention to, are shots such as this, right? Where you see one human and an endless uh, uh, series of cars in this big parking lot. This is a Renault factory, clearly. So the interaction between automobiles and humans is such in this film that automobiles are occupying space more than moving. And when they're moving inside the factory, then their movements are choreographed. They acquire an aesthetic significance, right? You're uh, taken by the rhythm of the production without really getting the sense of what is being done. The entire film focuses on the idea that in modern society, people are forced to repeat gestures as workers, as people moving through an urban landscape with a goal in mind. You're forced to repeat gestures that from the outside look entirely mechanical and almost devoid of meaning. For example, in this case, a car show is being set up. This is a hangar, of course, where they reproduce the car show in Amsterdam. The story, uh, quite simply, is the story of a small factory that has uh, come up with a new vehicle, an RV, a vehicle that can be used for camping, with plenty of gadgets inside to prepare the food, uh, you can sleep inside the vehicle, you can wash or shave, you can do everything inside this very small vehicle. And their goal, the vehicle has just been finished, is to bring the working prototype from Paris to a car show in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. So not too far, we're talking about a few hundred miles. With them, besides some staff from the factory, are two significant characters. One is the PR uh, woman, the woman in charge of PR, Maria. And the other is the engineer, the designer of the vehicle, who is Jacques Tati, the actor who plays the part of Monsieur Hulot. Monsieur Hulot is a character that you find in several of his films. They'll never get to Amsterdam. There will be one incident after the other that will slow down their arrival in Amsterdam so that everything they do is really out of sync with their purpose or out of place. Because, mind you, they will be able to showcase the vehicle. But instead of doing it in the proper setting, they will end up showcasing the vehicle and all of its gadgets inside the customs when they have to go cross the border into from France to Belgium or from, Be from Belgium into Holland. So in this case, at the beginning of the film, we see the people who are setting up the spaces for the various areas of the car show so that each brand and different models will occupy <coughs> different spaces in here. And in order to do that, they have to look at maps. And when they move around, they have to skip over wires that are almost invisible, that mark the various areas and also the passages for the spectators that will be walking around the various areas and uh, admiring the vehicles. So even this, becomes a ballet. You lose the sense that they're trying to do something meaningful 
and you just see humans that are acting mechanical, mechanically. So we're still within the theme of interactions between humans and machines that make the humans more machine-like. And this is generalized through society. The first scene where you see Monsieur Hulot, Jacques Tati, in here, dressed the way that the character of Monsieur Hulot dresses from its first appearance in the holidays of Monsieur Hulot from the 1950s, you can see that he's kind of the intruder, the alien, someone who doesn't conform to social rule fully. You also see him in a crowded space where in the background you see older buildings, right? No sign of modernity here, but a lot of space is being occupied by cars. So cars in the film are not represented as something that helps you move from point A to point B. Cars are in the road. You never know when you'll get somewhere and if, if you will get there, but for sure you see that people are spending a lot of time uh, uh, in their cars, on the road, and cars are also find, found, parked everywhere. So it's a paradox. Cars are supposed to enhance mobility, but very little movement happens around cars. Cars are either parked or trying to get somewhere where they will never in fact, before showing you the scenes, I want to show you the end of playtime, because in some ways this film is the extension of the 1967 playtime film, which you can find on Canopy, and so you can watch it for free as a Stony Brook student. Canopy.com, with a K, uh, is a platform where students and professors can log in uh, with, with the Stony Brook login credentials. At the very end of playtime, you find uh, Monsieur Hulot and an American tourist crossing each other's paths. Uh, he's trying to buy, she's an American tourist, he's trying to buy a souvenir for her, a gift, a little gift for her. But then they go outside and there is a roundabout, which are very common in Europe, and you see the cars are just going around. They're not going anywhere. It's like an amusement ride, like a carousel made of cars. And this is what you see, what, according to Jacques Tati's view, what you see in every modern urban space. Cars occupying the road, but not going quickly anywhere. And in fact, in here, they're not literally going anywhere because they're just circling, <coughs> going in a circle. So let's watch just a few minutes and then we'll of Playtime 1967 and then we'll move to the main feature of today, Traffic. I'll stop this and move to the next one and this is Traffic. <laughs> 